afternoon, everyone. I know this is probably the session before the lunch. Uh, this will test your patience. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so what we are going to do is, uh, first of all, very a little bit more about me, just to make sure um, you all understand uh, that little bit of confusion about uh, on the board there, it says Trendwise Analytics, and um, I'm actually part of the sponsor, Jigsaw Academy, and then my slides are saying Manipal ProLearn, uh, so to avoid any confusion. Uh, yeah, as I think is shown here, I'm a graduate from IIT Kharagpur, and I've uh, been in the industry for more than, almost 30 years, actually, more than 25. Um, in a variety of roles, I was with SAP Labs and so on. Uh, currently, I'm a full-time consultant with uh, Manipal ProLearn, helping them with creating this AIDL course, new AIDL course called uh, Postgraduate Certificate Program. And uh, I, I guess most of you are familiar with Jigsaw Academy, and uh, Manipal has actually acquired Jigsaw. So that's the connection between Trendwise, Jigsaw, and, uh, um, and Manipal. Um, in addition to that, I'm also the organizer of Bangalore Artificial Meetup Group. I don't know how many of you are uh, part of this. Anyone part of this group? OK, some of you maybe we have seen, met. Um, yeah, technically, I'm pretty hands-on, so I can do Python programming, and I'm familiar with R, though last two to three years I've not worked on R. But my specialization is in ML and deep learning, uh, more than, uh, sorry, um, AI, uh, TensorFlow and deep learning, and more than ML, I do more of uh, deep learning. So that's a little bit of uh, uh, more details about me. As far as today's session is concerned, what I did is, uh, I know usually this audience will be a little mix. Um, it's not a uniform audience. Um, so I kept it a little open in terms of my presentation. It is not tightly um, you know, formatted. Um, because typically, if you know, you know it's a um, homogeneous audience, then we can actually go with a tight uh, you know, deck. Uh, so I kept it open, based, and I can customize. I've done several sessions, so I can customize on the fly. Uh, I'll try to get a little bit of a feel of the audience, and then based on that, we can stay at a high level, or we can go all the way to do some coding together. Okay, so Google offers collabs. I think some of you may be familiar. We can also do some coding together. If you're interested, I think uh, you know, Wi-Fi access has been provided. Okay, so uh, that's how it will be, loose. And we'll also keep it informal in the sense that in between, we don't have to wait till the end for any questions. If you have any questions, um, just raise your hand and um, probably we'll pass the mic. Uh, and uh, uh, as soon as, uh, you know, if, if the, if, you, if I think that that will be covered later on, I'll anyway tell you, but I will be more than happy to answer it right away, and we can also you know, take the uh, presentation in, in that direction. But broadly, I have kind of, uh, I thought of putting something like emerging technologies, because very often when we talk about AI and deep learning, um, uh, you know, we, we need to understand that just AI and deep learning will not change our life. There are a lot of other things that are coming together, and that's what is going to change our life uh, in the next five to 10 years dramatically. Uh, then, of course, we'll focus on the core topic, which is deep learning, and then uh, TensorFlow. Um, and as you can imagine, deep learning itself is an extensive topic. Um, it has other components like neural networks and so on. Um, and TensorFlow, again, there, are, uh, there is a new release, uh, so I'm familiar with both of them. We can a little bit do comparison, and uh, I'll show you some demos. Um, and just to break the monotony, if required, I have a couple of videos as well, so I'll play some videos to demonstrate or dive, drive home some point. So it'll be a good combination of slides, videos, um, and code demos, okay? So live demos, live code demos. I actually had something to show on my mobile as well. Unfortunately, I'm not able to, I think because of the network, I'm not able to con connect that to my laptop. I wanted to cast it um, to show something, but we'll still give it a shot after some time, hopefully, if it works. So that's how uh, I have uh, planned it. Um, so before we get started, I would like to just uh, get a quick um, kind of a poll. How many of you are already working on AI DL projects? Okay, so it's about 30% probably, 30-40%. Um, how many of you are working with TensorFlow? I know, okay, all right, still lesser in number, that's good. And how many of you are working on TensorFlow 2.0? 
Okay, even much lesser. Okay, that's good. So my order of questions was also in that uh, sequence. All right. So this is pretty good. Uh, so it is in line with my expectation. Um, so what we'll do is, so there will be something for everyone. That's the good news. Um, so for some of you, it may be a little repetitive. Please bear with me. Um, so starting off with emerging technologies. By the way, I'm, um, I'm a technology enthusiast. And even though I've been in the industry for almost 30 years, I'm uh, 52 years old, officially 14 Jan was my birthday. Uh, but I have always been on the front end of technology. Uh, I started my career with SAP. And SAP, as you all know, is actually known or was earlier known for ERP. I never worked on ERP. I started with CRM, which was the, at that time, I was doing Salesforce automation. Those days, laptops were the in thing. You know, if you have a laptop, you have arrived. Uh, so it was like that. Starting from there, I moved on to analytics and now into AI and so on. So technology really um, kind of, uh, you know, um, excites me. So emerging technologies, a lot of emerging technologies are coming together. These are some of them just I picked up from Wikipedia. AI is, of course, one of them leading the pack. But you have a lot of other stuff like 3D printing, uh, gene, techno gene therapy. Um, there is one more which is probably missing. Robotics, of course, is there. Nanotechnology, because robotics uh, is also now becoming a little um, old-fashioned, I should say. Uh, what is new is the little teeny, teeny weeny ro robots, right? Uh, especially in healthcare, they will be inserted into your body. They will go and precisely attack the portion that is causing the problem, right? So combination of robotics and nanotechnology. Then the other thing which is probably not shown here is 5G technology. I'm sure all of you would have heard about. So all this put together, right? That's why this is a very, very exciting times. Uh, and AI, of course, deep learning and AI, deep learning is a major part. All this put together will actually truly, truly transform our lives in the next 10 years, right? It will completely different. I know you would have probably heard this 10 years back, but it is completely different because we this is going like a hockey stick and we are at, at this point where it, the, the bend is, okay? So that's the difference between probably last 10, 20 years and the next 10, 20 years, okay? So I wanted to just uh, bring that up and then this is the... Uh, Gartner's hype cycle. How many of you have seen this before? Are you familiar? Okay, good. A lot of you. So um, Gartner hype cycle, if you see, a lot of those technologies that I mentioned are already here. Okay, and uh, I, I hope I don't have to explain how to read this cycle uh, to th read this curve. But deep tech is right on the top right now. Okay, then you have IoT. I forgot to mention, but I think you all are familiar with IoT, um, edge computing. Uh, in fact, edge AI is one of the areas here, as you can see here, right? So all these technologies and of course autonomous vehicles and so on, all this put together when they come together, not just AI, AI will be used in some of these places, uh, will actually, yeah, that's the idea behind, uh, I just thought uh, that you should be aware of all these uh, uh, other emerging technologies in addition to AI as well. Now, when we talk about AI and deep learning, um, very often we think that US is probably at the front end. Um, in terms of new technologies, which is to a large extent true. While a lot of new research is happening in AI uh, in, in US, um, but guess who is leading in terms of adoption? China, okay? You must have already read. Um, facial recognition is completely, it's kind of predominant in China. People no longer, uh, you know, they don't even accept credit card in some places. You, you pay with your face, that's it, right? Uh, you pay with a smile, they say, okay? And uh, uh, even traffic violations, you must have seen some videos, uh, guys who do jaywalking, uh, immediately their picture is shown on the screen and shame, shame on you, right? Uh, that has much bigger impact than sending a chalan secretly behind the scenes. So uh, China is leading the pack. Uh, I just wanted to bring that up and also uh, help you understand. So here, if you see, this is a, a benchmark. Um, so from a development perspective, of course, China is lagging, but they are picking up very fast. I, I'm sure you must have heard about that they have an agenda that by 2030, they want to be the AI superpower. And they are well on their way, by the way, right? Because they don't really care about uh, privacy and things like that. That's a kind of no-no uh, there. Um, but in terms of adoption, if you see here, this is, I hope this pointer is working. Uh, no, okay. So adoption is uh, number one, uh, but in terms of development, still uh, US is leading. All right. 
So yeah, this was uh, one example. I know this is uh, probably uh, typically when I conduct sessions in a, in a smaller group, we, we try to do like a small debate. What do you think, whether it is good, bad, or ugly, right? Because there are good side to it uh, the, in terms of new technology, everyone should adopt. Uh, but a lot of people are, um, you know, wary about it that, okay, your privacy is lost and things like that. Um, but I'm one who really want to adopt new technologies. By the way, facial recognition, probably some of you are aware, uh, is also being used in our, uh, our airports for check-in. Uh, and in fact, uh, once I was traveling and I was in Hyderabad, they were doing a trial run, I happily signed up. A lot of my friends were like, what the hell are you doing? So, <laughs> right? But I, I really like it because, you know, yeah, it's a double-edged sword, no doubt, but if you put the uh, if there are checks and balances in place, I think it's uh, it will definitely help. Uh, just imagine, uh, you know, breezing past the uh, checking counters and so on. That's so exciting. Automotive uh, industry, yeah, there are some other industries where AI is being used. I think autonomous vehicles uh, is an area. So what, what I'm, in case some of you are wondering, what I'm going to do is go come from a very high level and then come all the way to code, okay? So don't get worried. So autonomous vehicles is, again, all of you are aware probably, um, this, is, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a car by which company? Why more? Yeah, so very often I hear Tesla. Uh, that's also another uh, phenomenon known as uh, uh, mind share, right? Because anything to do with cars, we think it is Tesla. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tesla is also doing, by the way, self-driving cars. But this is a Google Waymo car. It was acquired by Google, and they are the ones who started. And as you can see, uh, th there is a lot of uh, uh, deep learning uh, involved here. Um, it, it has all these sensors which are feed into the onboard AI, and there is deep learning there, right? There is a trained model sitting on board which is taking all the all the decisions. Uh, retail is another uh, industry where uh, AI and deep learning are extensively being adopted. Um, have you all heard about this Amazon Go store? Yeah, great. So, uh, in case some of that, uh, any, in, uh, you know, many of you have not seen or anything, just let me know. I have all those videos. So, um, but yeah, this was this video was in fact viral. So, uh, Amazon Go predominantly works on deep learning. It tries to identify what you have chosen, and then if you put it back, again, it will also detect that you have put it back and so that you are not uh, charged in case you don't take it, right? So uh, retail is one uh, industry heavily using. Then we have healthcare is a major, major adopter of uh, deep learning and AI. Um, and uh, one of the areas, big areas, is uh, diagnostics. And uh, diagnostics actually uses image recognition uh, and image classification. And uh, the, um, it, one of the, I think, the reasons why it is really, really critical here is it can really change uh, change our life. Because the, today the uh, problem with, for example, diseases like cancer, it's not that it cannot be cured. Cancer can be cured unlike maybe 10, 15 years back. Uh, cancer was like almost a death knell. But uh, today, cancer can be cured provided it is detected early on. And one of the problems in detecting cancer is that very often the symptoms are not visible till it has progressed uh, 70, 80%. I know many of you probably uh, know someone in your family affected or something like that. Even my mom died of uh, kidney cancer. Um, so it's, it's really bad. Unfortunately, uh, there are issues in terms of uh, expertise is not there. There are very few oncologists. Um, so even if you do all those, uh, you know, diagnostic stuff, you create the X-ray and all that. Uh, predicting, you know, somebody has to take a look at that. That takes a lot of uh, a lot of time. So that is where AI is being uh, tried out in terms of can we train these guys to uh, at least make a very high level, um, you know. Um, um, uh, filtering, high level filtering. So then what can happen is, um, like we do for some of the cases, like women are asked to go for breast cancer uh, check every year. So something like that, screening can be done. So whether you have symptoms or not, perform the screening, uh, all kinds of uh, you know cancers, uh, but you don't have so many people, so you kind of automate that. So that's the idea behind. So don't be under the impression that these things will come and replace the doctors. No way, that will not, uh, very far off. It may happen at some point, but. Um, so cancer and some of the diseases basically are uh, where it is being applied as uh, cancer to a large extent. Um, I think many of you are familiar with uh, IBM's Watson, right? So Watson made waves when uh, it defeated uh, 
the jeopardy the the champions of uh, you know human champions of jeopardy but subsequently that was just a, uh, you know introduction but subsequently they have uh, commercialized it and uh, uh, converted it into a, a healthcare product and uh, watson is predominantly used for lung cancer detection and so on and uh, in another area which is blindness a lot of research is happening in case of blindness uh, uh, for for detecting blindness, this is again another very very unfortunate area uh, where a lot of people uh, go blind uh, just because it is not not detected in time. And one of the major uh, causes is uh, diabetic retinopathy. So Google and uh, Microsoft and all these guys are doing a lot of research in this, and they have they made quite a bit of uh, progress there. Uh, so that's another area where. Uh, in, in, in healthcare where it is uh, being used. So now slowly we will come get a little more technical. So uh, we, all of you would have heard about AI, ML, DL, all of this, you know, uh, being talked about together. So what exactly is the correlation between AI, ML and DL? So this slide very nicely uh, depicts the relation between AI, ML and DL. And of course, in, sitting inside uh, nicely is neural networks. So AI is can be considered as the overarching concept. And in order to achieve AI, uh, we need machine learning. Okay. So machine learning, in a way, is the is the more technical part inside of AI. And contrary to uh, you know our intuition, deep learning is actually a subset of machine learning. It's not the big brother. It's the small brother. Okay. So the the reason being. Uh, in deep learning also we have the fundamentals still remain or they are coming from machine learning. So for example, you want to do classification. Classification is actually a machine learning concept or you want to do regression. The primary difference, there are a couple of differences, but the primary difference between machine learning and deep learning is that we use neural networks in, in deep learning. So that is the uh, primary difference. Of course, there are a few others like for example, when uh, you with the traditional machine learning you use uh, structured data with with uh, deep learning, you use unstructured data like images and uh, and uh, uh, voice and uh, text and so on. Uh, the last part is a little bit more technical, which is uh, feature extraction. In machine learning, we manually do the feature extraction. In deep learning, the neural networks uh, take care of uh, uh, of the feature extraction. Now, the term deep learning comes from uh, the concept of neural networks because neural networks can be deep. There are multiple layers. We call that a deep neural network and therefore the term deep uh, learning or deep tech, uh, nowadays it is also referred to as deep tech, comes from, from that. So we'll take a, a little look at what, what neural networks is and, and how to go about. Uh, so this is a little bit of a history of deep learning, uh, if you will. And uh, I should give credit to one of the speakers uh, at one of the universities. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have put it. The credit there is not mine uh, completely. So it actually, it's not a new concept. By the way, some of you may be also aware that AI itself is not a very new concept, right? Um, so it was, it was uh, AI per se, the term was brought, uh, uh, brought up in the 1950s. And uh, uh, right, but there was not a lot of progress made. So similarly, even the neural networks, the the term or the concept was uh, 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 you know brought up in 1943, and slowly we made some progress. But the last few years, as you can see, have been really phenomenal. So we have CNN, uh, LSTM, RNN. Uh, and uh, you know now the latest is uh, transformers, uh, which is in a way not even using neural nets. Uh, yeah, transformers is there, which came last year. Uh, so that's a little bit of uh, uh, you know history, if you will. But uh, artificial intelligence today uh, has two main areas. Um, I think we we all are aware that. Um, artificial intelligence is in a way simulating our human brain, right? And what does our, our human brain do? It basically captures information from our senses and then takes some action. That's pretty much it, right? And how many senses do we have? Five or six? Five, yeah. So people often get confused. Six senses, so people say six. We have five senses, right? So we have uh, vision, uh, uh, you know, hearing and speech and all these. So uh, today, uh, with, in spite of all the hype, we have not been able to achieve, or, you know, do much with all the all the senses. Predominantly, we did in two or three. 
Uh, image is the main one, which is the vision. We did a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, progress there. We made a lot of progress there. And uh, hearing and speaking, these are uh, in a way combined together. Uh, and we made some progress there as well. Last few years, especially with the transformers, we are making a little bit more in the speech recognition area. But uh, a large part of it uh, over the last few years has been uh, on image recognition, also because it is a little easier to uh, to handle compared to speech recognition, right? Where we need to have um, RNN and, and so on. So training uh, training in RNN is uh, not very easy, whereas uh, CNN is relatively easier. So image recognition, if you see, there are, again, that's like a broad topic. And uh, image recognition has also been there before. We used to more call it like computer vision and so on. Uh, but broadly, there are three areas, I would say, again, don't uh, hold me to it, but broadly in terms of learning, we have image classification and then we have object detection and sometimes these two are confused, so I thought I will kind of clarify. Uh, and then of course a more uh, specific one, uh, I have put it there as facial recognition, right? So it is a, a little bit more uh, specialized version of uh, image recognition. So image classification is like, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, the classical example of image recognition is you give a, a system a bunch of images of cats and dogs and it is able to classify which is a cat, which is a dog, right? And even today, anyone conducting training uh, will start off with this cat-dog classical example. Um, so th th in this case, I have put up a pizza and uh, I will basically see if I can run a, a, a live code and uh, show you that I can um, let my system, I, all right, I can uh, uh, show you that I can get my system to recognize uh, a pizza image. So let's just take a quick look uh, if this uh, works. Hopefully it should, um, I think this part of the code is on my local. So... All right, so very often uh, we, we feel that if you want to do something like this, you have to start from scratch in terms of you have to train a model and things like that. But one of the good things about uh, deep learning in general is that there are a lot of pre-trained models. So this will be with a pre-trained model and therefore you'll see that the lines of code that I have written is very less. So I'm just, I'll not go through the entire code obviously line by line, uh, but uh, very quickly what I'm doing is I'm importing um, the required libraries. I'm loading a pre-trained model and in this particular example, I have a kitty, but I will change that to our favorite pizza. Okay, it's taking a little while, yeah, just. Yeah, so this is all live, it's not recorded. Um, so I'm loading a, a pre-trained model. There are a lot of pre-trained models like VGGNet, ResNet, and, and so on. So in this case, um, I'm using uh, ResNet. Um, and these pre-trained models are somebody has, you know, uh, trained them with millions of images. ImageNet is a, is a wonderful, uh, you know, collection of images. Um, as I think some of you are at least, uh, most of you must be already familiar with machine learning, right? Are you all familiar with machine learning? Okay, good number of you. So you must be aware that uh, the data preparation takes a lot of time, right, in machine learning. Same holds true here as well. So what uh, ImageNet does is it has kind of prepared a lot, millions of images neatly, you know, um, put and tagged and so on. So uh, these, most of these models, pre-trained models are, uh, have used ImageNet. In case you're not familiar, just go to imagenet.com. Uh, I think, uh, but it is not a, uh, you know, it's not a model. Very often people confuse it to be a pre-trained model. ImageNet itself is not a model. It is a collection of uh, images and they conduct, uh, uh, every year almost they conduct a competition and people submit their models and some of the toppers will be, uh, you know, made like open source and made available. So VGG uh, net, or oh, sorry, ResNet I'm using in this case, I use sometimes VGG also, uh, is, is one of those, right? And uh, some of the, mostly these are developed by uh, uh, big companies and they are able to, by the way, classify up to a thousand. I think ResNet has thousand images, thousand classes it can classify, uh, which means that the day-to-day -day objects like uh, table, chair, animals, cat, dog, and all, which, uh, what do you call that, which, uh, 
uh, breed, yeah, thank you. So which breed it belongs to, right? So to that extent, and in fact, there are some models which can go up to 9,000, 10,000 classes as well. So you can just reuse, these are all free for you to use. You can just reuse these models without having to train, okay? So in my case now, I have loaded my uh, pizza and uh, let's see if, I, again, I'll not explain the entire thing here, but um, some of you may be able to read it as well. So, okay, so this was the previous image. It was Egyptian cat, as you can see, it didn't, didn't say just a cat. And now if I put this, it says, this is a pizza, right? So I have a couple of uh, other images so I can show you uh, so that you don't think these are predefined or anything like that. I have randomly put some images. Uh, what do you think this is? Okay, yeah, so you will see what it is. So by the way, these labels are all, um, you know, American labels in a way, right? Uh, so you will see that it is. it will not show as a truck, but it will say it's a trailer truck. That's the US way of calling it. Uh, similarly, if I submit a, uh, a ship, it will say it's a liner, cruise liner, they call it more, right? For more fashionable. And uh, even if I submit an airplane, it will say airliner. So just to give you a little bit of flavor, because labeling is all by us. So we can define what, what the label should be at the time of training. And accordingly, um, of course, this is the, the text part. So it will, the system itself will actually return a number. And if you just see, uh, just I will not go into all the details, but this is the one. Decode predictions is basically getting the, res, uh, the, the converting the number into a actual text, okay? Because everything in deep learning, machine learning is numbers. You must be already knowing, right? Even text, uh, the, the encoding that in the previous session we saw, uh, that is basically converting text into numbers, encoding, decoding, and so on, right? Word embeddings. Uh, so everything is numbers. Even in this case, this image is actually a bunch of numbers, a bunch of pixel values. That's what we are feeding in. We would have trained. And the output will again be a number. And we need to now take that number and say, okay, this number means it is a, uh, it is a pizza or it is a cat or so on. Okay. So um, this is a, a truck. And we will come back to this when we, when we, talk, about, um, when we talk about the speech recognition part. Now, image, so what we did right now is image classification. Um, so, what, what, is the, what is the relation between this, what we did, and ML? So, what I showed you is actually deep learning because it involves an image, which is unstructured data, and it involves neural nets. Behind the scenes, there is a neural network, CNN, convolutional neural network. Uh, but where does ML come in here? What I did, the technique is classification, which is an ML technique, okay? So there is nothing, uh, from, a, from that perspective, there's nothing new. So what we did is image classification. And uh, while image classification is useful, but what is more useful and what is more commonly used is object detection. So what is the difference between these two? Very often people confuse what is object detection. So in my, in my image classification, it basically takes the entire image and based on the patterns, it says for this whole image, it will say what it is. Uh, okay, whether there is it's a cat or a dog, or it again based on the training uh, that you training images that you have given. You give a, you know a bunch of blank images and you label them as cats, uh, and then when you submit a blank image, it will say it's a cat because the system doesn't know, right? It it just it based on the training data set. So whereas in case of object detection. If you submit an image, it will actually tell you what are the different objects. So it, again, that also needs training, but it will also, uh, so it will basically detect multiple uh, objects in that, okay? So, and uh, not only it will detect and, uh, uh, and identify, but it will also create like what we call it as bounding boxes. Okay, so let's take a quick look of, uh, of uh, object detection as well. Uh, I have a, a piece of uh, live code here. This will use uh, webcam and it will take a little while to run. So in case uh, um, it's taking time, just bear with me. Same here, we are using a pre-trained model. I'm not uh, training anything new and uh, so what it will do once it is ready, it will basically use my webcam and try to detect, I'm using, okay, uh, the, what I'm doing here is not with just an image, it's an extension of the image. Um, I'm using, uh, yeah, I'm actually using uh, 
a video here, right? So video is what, in when we say video analytics, it's nothing but extension of an image. So you have multiple frames coming in. So whatever you're processing with one image, you process with that one frame. And continuously when you keep processing, that becomes your video analytics, right? So I'm extending that. Instead of showing you a object detection in an image, I'm showing you object detection in a video. So I think now we got this. Okay, so it identifies, thank God, me as person. Uh, um, now let me move out and show something. Okay, does it show? Uh, traffic light, yeah, okay. A cell phone or a cup, okay. There is actually a cup as well here. Let's see if it... I'm sorry, I'm a little disoriented. Okay, yeah, finally it is. Yeah, so it's it's a little choppy, not not maybe 100%. Uh, let's see what it does for this guy. It says it's a person. <laughs> so I, uh, the beauty is that, of course, this is using TensorFlow, and it can actually work on, uh, TensorFlow has the capabilities, we'll go into the uh, little bit of details of TensorFlow, but since we are on object detection, uh, I wanted to show you that it can work on your uh, mobile as well. So this is my, um, unfortunately I can't project it on my screen, uh, but this is, so if you can see some of you, right? Can you see a little? So uh, I'm, I'm not sure, am I being shown here or? Okay, it, <sighs> there's some ad. Okay, so yeah, let's see, this is, uh, is it saying some TV screen or something? Okay. No, no, keep the screen on. What happened? No. So it says it's a laptop, for example. I, I know you can't read it from there, but it is seeing this as a laptop and uh, it is, uh, uh, Okay, it's also saying it's a person. So anyway, um, I, I had a way of uh, projecting it here. Unfortunately, with this network, it, it is not working. Uh, but uh, uh, by the way, uh, in case you're interested, you can go to Google Play, Play Store, and download, look for object detection with TensorFlow. Anybody can, you can regular, there's no hi-fi phone required regular. Uh, I have a Samsung phone. Any regular smartphone will work. It's really interesting. And you also have, uh, by the way, while we are at it, there is something called a lens. Amazon, I think this is Amazon, Amazon lens, right? This works on a similar way, but the beauty is that you can, uh, you know, it identifies uh, an object, like for example, in this case, uh, let's see if it is, huh. So it, you see that circular dot, I don't know if you're able to see. If I point on that, it will show me on the web, you know, way to purchase this item, right? Oh, right, right, smart. <laughs> no, I don't think, uh, let me see, let me, Google Lens, ah, sorry, it's not Amazon. So, right, so I, as you can see here, that circular thing, at least to some extent, you can see that blue color, uh, right? Uh, you, you, if you click on that, it will, uh -huh. okay. So, uh, what, what do we do? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, you want to, okay. Can you, can you zoom it? That's okay, while you figure out, I will continue. Let me know when you're ready, uh, if you are able to zoom. Okay, so this is, um, uh, you know, uh, on object detection, and as you can see, yeah, so uh, the point I was trying to make was, it is not only telling, uh, yeah, okay, so let me, let us try that. You are trying to zoom, I think. Can you zoom here? Ah, very good, yes, thank you. I think this is much better, okay? So let me go back and uh, uh, I will try something like, This is real challenge. 
I can't use uh, my other hand, right? Anyway, so if we if we point that, right, it shows like a circular, whatever, uh, you know, any item that you show, it will show a circular thing. And then when you uh, click on that, it will basically take you to uh, a, a e-commerce site or somewhere where you can purchase. Very interesting. So you should uh, probably download this Google Lens and uh, try it out. This again is another application of uh, deep learning. Okay. All right. So thank you for that. Um, so well, let's go back to our session on uh, the slides rather. So facial recognition, um, I don't have a good uh, demo here, but uh, facial recognition, as you all are already aware, is becoming very popular. A uh, lot of uh, companies are doing this, uh, maybe for uh, you know taking attendance and uh, security is the main thing, right? Uh, facial recognition is used for security. Um, so there are there are there are a lot of uh, uses. So these are some of the real life applications um, of image and. Uh, um, uh, yeah, image classification, object detection, and so on. So how does this work? So behind the scenes, there is something known as convolutional neural networks. So what I'll do is when we go into the neural network part, um, I, will, I will talk about that, right? And there is also a way of learning neural networks, so I'll just show you a little bit how to go about in case you're new to uh, neural networks. Um, the other area is, okay, I already have the slide. I'll come back to this, okay? It doesn't make sense to uh, go straight into that. Um, the other area is uh, speech recognition, right? So speech recognition, um, I think many of you might have, have you seen uh, Sundar Pichai's uh, video uh, at Google I.O.? Anyone? Okay, many of you have seen, yeah? So that's fantastic, right? The duet. So it, it basically, is, um, it, it, it's almost like a real human being. Uh, it, you know, in most of the cases, uh, when we say speech recognition, you can identify that there is, a, there is a system that is talking, right? Even Alexa has a very characteristic voice. Uh, but in this case, all those nuances are, uh, you know, captured. Uh, uh, you know, so that is, that is some of the advances that are happening. We did not see a lot uh, over the last few years because training um, uh, uh, speech, uh, in speech recognition we use RNN and training RNN is very difficult. Uh, and also the other issue is that um, in case of speech recognition there are two parts uh, unlike image. Um, what they do is they take the speech is converted into text and then the text is processed using natural language processing, NLP, and then it is converted back into speech, okay, synthesized back into speech. So that's why it is a little bit more complicated, and the type of uh, neural networks they use there, like an image, we use CNN broadly. Uh, in case of speech, we use recurrent neural nets, or RNN. And training an RNN, again, is not very easy because they, 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 it is sequential. So parallelization is not um, very uh, easy with the RNN. So that is one of the reasons why we were not able to make a lot of progress there. But I think off late, uh, there is a lot happening in the speech recognition area. This new concept of transformers, uh, I think, is really, in a way, revolutionizing. And uh, uh, these are uh, pre-trained. They are also pre-trained models like images. Uh, in speech, there are not a lot of them, but now they are coming up with pre-trained models. So with that, I think uh, speech will also um, make a lot of progress. Um, so, But we do have applications already, like, for example, Alexa um, or even... Uh, uh, with what is Google Home, I think, right? So uh, these are already available, um, and they do a good job. But um, they they need a lot of uh, you know computation power. So people uh, like you and me will probably not be able to do very easily that easily. On the other hand, like image recognition, you can really do uh, very easily. So just a quick demo of the speech as well. Um, so in this in the previous example, what we did was we stopped at. Um, the, displaying this uh, image here, right? Uh, telling what kind of, uh, um, what the image is. But now you can also um, make this, make my system uh, speak, right? So I'm using Google text-to-speech. Some of you may be familiar, Google text-to-speech, right? And this is um, available free and uh, on cloud. So I'm making actually an API call, and uh, so it should be done by now, yeah. And it kind of, uh, I save it as my, as an mp3 file, and uh, you'll see the voice will be interesting, let us see. It's a trailer underscore truck. So it has literally right, translated 
that underscore as well huh? so trailer underscore truck is a trailer underscore truck okay so if we go back for example and uh, change that image to my pizza or uh, let us take this i am 4 that we were seeing earlier right so this was the image of a cat so normally you would say this is a cat but in this case you'll see that it also tells us the breed i think it is a tabby cat i guess oh egyptian cat okay so and then i can convert this into text to speech is a egyptian underscore cat yeah <laughs> okay all right so now how do we do this as you have seen the um what i have used uh, in in these cases is uh, tensorflow now there are different uh, libraries available uh, what exactly is tensorflow tensorflow is a deep learning library and as you can see there are other libraries like pytorch and so on there is a usually a competition between pytorch and tensorflow but as of today tensorflow seems to be leading the pack and it is very popular um pytorch also is looks like it is catching up so i keep track of it and uh, uh, tensorflow is a deep learning library it is not really a programming language as sometimes people confuse um and uh, it is uh, open sourced by google so google actually developed this for their own internal development this is by google uh, the a team called google brain these guys are so i think among the smartest within google and they develop these uh, applications like google photos and uh, um, google search and so on right so uh, they have developed this for their internal um, you know development uh, activities and then they have open sourced it so it has uh, within a very short period of time it has become very popular uh, it could also be um, you know riding on google's popularity but uh, it also has really cool features one of the main things is that uh, it it is highly scalable it's not very easy to learn let me tell you it's not very easy to learn especially the uh, 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 tensorflow 1 right some of you if you have used tensorflow tensorflow 1 is not very easy to easy to learn there some disturbance yeah not very easy to learn tensorflow 2 on the other hand there some disturbance jacket okay it's open i'm not touching it <laughs> okay so uh, th that there's a learning curve for 1.0 tensorflow 1.x there is a learning curve yeah okay want to put it here yeah, yeah clip it yeah okay yeah thank you is better okay yeah so uh, tensorflow 1.x there is a huge learning curve and uh, thank god now we have 2.0 um and uh, it's a lot of that has been taken away a lot of that complexity in 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 training or oh, sorry in uh, programming has been taken away the core the language we use is python you can potentially use java as well but we we use python one of the you know important or the the uh, features important and uh, you know critical features of tensorflow is that it can be deployed on multiple devices as as you have seen i've shown you on my mobile as well so you can develop once and then you know uh, deploy in multiple uh, multiple platforms that is uh, the the uh, main thing about uh, tensorflow and uh, so this very quickly again I don't want to make it too technical but with uh, i'll do a quick comparison between tensorflow 1.0 and tensorflow 2.0 and uh, so in tensorflow 1.0 Uh, if you wanted to do write some code using python uh, these are the elements uh, within your code so there are what is known as uh, constants then you have variables and and then you have placeholders these are uh, the different types of variables actually in normal programming language when you say a variable it's a variable only data types will vary right but here you have different types of variable and then you can define what data type you want for each of them um and then when you define these variables they become a part of what is known as a computational graph so this is basically uh, in tensorflow 1.0 we had this uh, concept of lazy execution 
right? In 2.0, it is eager ex execution. 1.0, we have lazy execution, which means that you need to write your code like in two parts. First, you create your computational graph, and then you execute in that session at the bottom. So you create a session and execute that graph in a session. This is typically uh, overhead, um, but the thing is that the, the, uh, its strength is that it is highly scalable. Now, once you have this, you deploy it on a cluster uh, across GPUs, and that's the advantage of uh, in this particular model, okay? So that's how they initially designed. But in TensorFlow 2.0, I hope I have a slide. Yeah, okay. So this is the computational graph. So it's, this is a, a, a kind of a diagrammatic representation. So let's say you want to write a function C is equal to Wx plus B. You need to first create, uh, add all those nodes, the W, X, and B, they, they are all parts of that computational uh, graph, the nodes they are called, right? Nodes of this computational graph. So every uh, variable is a node, and every uh, little computation that you do, like you add, right, or you multiply, each of them becomes a, a node as well. And you can individually execute each node in your session. Either you execute the entire result, like C, or you can also just execute a, an intermediate node to see what's going on, okay? And these A, B, the W, X, B can be constants, variables, placeholder, depending on uh, um, what exactly you want. Now with, uh -huh, good, so in TensorFlow 2.0, luckily, uh, they have reduced the complexity. So now, um, it is eager execution by default. You can still do, um, uh, you can still do lazy execution, uh, but for your development purpose, uh, what you can do is you set it in a, a eager mode. So you continue your development, and once your um, model is ready, you uh, turn on the um, lazy execution to get the scalability, right? Because the whole idea was to get a scalability. Uh, so you you can, there is something known as a, a TF dot function decorator. So you add that decorator and you can increase the uh, your scalability and get back the same scalability like before. Uh, so I, again, I didn't want to get too technical because some of you probably, uh, and this is too short a time as well. But if some of you are game for it, I will, we can also do a quick hands-on uh, you can access Colab, so if you want to switch on your laptops and connect and be ready. Uh, we can do a little hello world, see the comparison between how you write the code in 1.0 and how you write it in 2.0. So those interested can keep your systems ready. Uh, just log in and log into your Google and be ready. Colab is a Google uh, free cloud-based uh, cloud uh, uh, environment, development environment, so I'll just help you with that. Okay, so this is a neural network. This is a deep neural network. Our deep learning comes from here, the term deep learning. So this is a deep neural network having multiple layers, right? The, the deep tech term comes from here. And uh, um, the, the basic component is basically uh, that nodes that you see here in between, that is the basic component which is known as a neuron. Right? And this is, uh, this is modeled after our human brain, which has billions of neurons, okay? So they are, in a way, simulating the human brain. So uh, the smallest component within a neural network is a neuron. And very often, uh, you know, learning neural nets and deep learning uh, are getting trained on this, uh, you need to follow a little bit of a, a, you know, a plan. Otherwise, if you just randomly go and uh, try to learn, it becomes very difficult, right? So this is a small plan which when I conduct, by the way, I conduct trainings as well. So when I conduct, I kind of follow this and I encourage all of you to follow this kind of a model. Uh, you, of course, you will need some prerequisites. You need to know a little bit of Python. Even You don't have to be an expert, but at least, and Python is a very easy language to learn. Um, and uh, of course, then you need to have uh, before you go into TensorFlow, uh, sorry, before you go into uh, neural networks, uh, you need to understand TensorFlow a little bit. So get get uh, some, uh, you know, uh, trained on TensorFlow, right? Learn TensorFlow rather. Um, and of course, uh, there is uh, machine learning, a little bit of basics because you need to understand the concept of training a model, uh, separating uh, data into training data set and uh, um, uh, training data set and test data set. Uh, by the way, I'm not doing anything, huh? <laughs> uh, so all this is uh, machine learning, so that much you need to know. After that, 
you need to start with understanding the working of a neuron, right? We call that as a perceptron. A single neuron is a perceptron. Now, a perceptron is nothing but a mathematical representation. When we talk about neural network, very often people think there is something physical here. There's no. It is not a physical entity. It is represented in a like a node, but there are there, there are no nodes there. So it is just a piece of code. Okay. So it's very important to understand how that works, and I will just show you in just a bit, and then go step by step. First build and understand, uh, and don't stra start straight away. Very often when we talk about deep learning training, people straight away start with images. Don't do that, okay? First understand the neural network. You can use neural network with structured data as well, right? So you start with the CSV file. First understand how a neuron works, and then slowly. So the way I would recommend is start to learn about a neuron using a CSV file, then understand how to create a layer of neurons, okay? Keep using your CSV file, then understand how multi-layer right, neural networks work. That is basically the deep learning part of it. And this is what is known as uh, fully connected or uh, fully connected or dense layers. Okay? And then you move on to CNN, which is convolutional neural networks, which are the new neural networks used for image recognition. Right? So very often people try to go straight there and uh, they they're completely lost. Oh, by the way, in between, uh, Keras is a very, very powerful API. And uh, this is not, uh, not a library, by the way, right? Because it needs a library behind. So it works on top of TensorFlow or PyTorch. So Keras is very popular. And uh, a lot of development, production level development that happens is, is using Keras. And I also seen that people uh, try to learn directly using Keras which is okay because you don't have to worry about the complexities of a neuron and session and so on. But then if you really want to understand what's going on, you would rather start with uh, you know, uh, the core uh, TensorFlow, learn how a neuron works, how the training works, and then move on to Keras. Um, because coding with Keras is actually very, very easy. And before you go to convolutional neural networks, it's a good idea because convolutional neural networks are always multi-layer. So it becomes much easier with Keras rather than hand coding uh, with TensorFlow. Uh, and then the last is the most complicated one, ones to understand are the recurrent neural networks, RNN. Okay, so keep that to the last. All right, so what we'll do is, you want to change the mic? Hello, hello, check. Okay, all right. So what we'll do is, uh, as I said, uh, I will take you through a quick demo. This was my last slide. Um, so I will take you through the demo of uh, creating or writing some code uh, in uh, um, 1.x and then show you how it is different in 2.0. So if you are interested, you can open up your uh, browser and search for Google Colab. Okay, if you search for Google Colab, you will see something like this. Um, you should be logged on to your Google account. Okay, and uh, you can create a new file like this. Okay, and we'll do a simple hello world in case uh, you want to do it along with me. So, by the way, this is the perceptron code. Okay, this is how you implement a perceptron. This is in 2.0, and the corresponding uh, probably I don't have the 1.01. Uh, all right, so we have um, Colab open. So the first thing you need to do is Colab is just like a Jupyter notebook environment. So you can do anything in general, write any Python code in general, not necessarily just TensorFlow. Okay. So, but if you want to write something for TensorFlow, you have to import your TensorFlow library. So we write import TensorFlow STF. Okay, so, oh, yeah. So by default, as of now, it will actually uh, get you 1.x version. And I will also show you if you want to do for 2.0 what, what you need to do. 
So this will uh, import your uh, 1.15, which is the latest or the last 1.x version. And then uh, while it is running, let me just go ahead in the interest of time to create. So we create a variable. Okay, hello is equal to tf dot constant, and we say hello world. Okay, and while that is going on, so as you can see here, it says um, constant. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So as you can see, it says that very soon it will switch to 2.0, but it has not yet. By the way, but 2.0 is now readily is available now. Till about few months back, it was in beta. Uh, now it is uh, ready, and you can actually install 2.0. But by default, it's still. But a lot of work is still on 1.x. So in the industry, there is still demand for 1.x. So don't be under the impression that okay, now if I have to learn, I'll just straight away go for 2.0. Because, uh, I mean, to be very honest, there are not a lot of jobs in 2.0 uh, because a lot of work is still happening in 1.x, okay? All right, so now, if I want to now print this in normal uh, programming language or in normal Python, if I just say hello, it would have printed my text, right? But in this, it doesn't. This is what is lazy execution. So what I have to do, even though it is a small thing, I still have to create my session like so. Ses is equal to tf dot, okay? And then execute this particular node, says dot run. Okay, so only then it will print. So this is the lazy execution part. This is what happens in 1.x. The same thing now, if I have to do it in 2.0, how do I do that? Uh, it's slightly different in terms of, um, let's say I go here. Okay, I have to install 2.0 in my environment. So I'll, uh, that should be pretty fast. So I'll open up another notebook here. Uh, sorry, I need to open here. And I do a pip install. Now I can do I can do in a couple of ways. This is one of them, uh, very similar to what we did earlier, constant. Okay. So let it come up. So while this is going on, in case you have any questions, just raise your hand and we'll, I think we have some mics around. Uh, yeah, there, can you please pass a mic here? Yeah, yeah. So pip install. Hello. Yeah, yeah, just one second. Pip install TensorFlow equals equals 2.0, okay? By the way, if you're doing a pip install on your local uh, local system, if by default there it will install 2.0. So you need to be careful there. Huh? It's the other way around. Here it is 1.0. So yeah, please go with your question. Yeah, so I have uh, two questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, something, can we talk about uh, transfer learning? Okay. Right? Mm. Uh, and second thing is the challenges. So, mm -hmm. uh, whenever we use a pre-trained model yeah, yeah. and uh, then we feed uh, our data yeah, to customize yeah. it, yes, yes. Uh, generally we don't uh, get uh, good results. Yes, yeah. Accuracy would not be up to the mark. Correct. So, how can we improve it and yeah, what are yeah. the things we should take yeah. care good, of? Good questions. In the meanwhile, anyone else has a question, raise your hand, Mike will go there. So, transfer learning is a very important concept. So, what I've shown you was a pre-trained model and that pre-trained model as I said, has been trained for certain types or certain classes. There are thousand 
different classes, but they are they are in a way fixed. So if you uh, you know try uh, to uh, classify with some other uh, image, it will not work. Okay. Now what transfer learning does is it takes these pre-trained model and some of the layers will be in a way disabled, and then you train those layers with your new data. Okay. The idea here is why is it called transfer learning? When we are doing, uh, when we are training a model, you have seen there are multiple layers. So the initial layers, in a way, especially in image recognition, uh, do the same thing, whether it is for cats or dogs or something else. They are what is known as edge detection and the lines and so on and so forth, right? Those features, low level features. So that's the idea. They, they, we, we see that that can be reused because uh, it, no matter what the image is, the low level features remain the same. And then only the high level features towards the end we need to train. So that is at a very high level transfer learning. I hope that makes sense. Um, and uh, coming to your customizing, yes. So uh, remember, the, uh, these deep learning uh, uh, you know, the networks are as good as your data. If you have good data, uh, please give a mic there. I think there's a question. So uh, if you have good labeled data, it will work fantastic. If you ha don't have uh, good labeled data, unfortunately, you can't blame the uh, network as well. But coming to your question about accuracy, you definitely can, for a given data, you can increase the accuracy by what is known as hyperparameter tuning, right? So increase the number of iterations, increase the number of uh, layers, increase the number of neurons per layer. So these are the hyperparameters. But then there is a limit to which you can do that. You will not get 100% accuracy every time. That's for, for one. Uh, even 70-80%, uh, you know, it depends, a lot of it depends on the data. Uh, like for example, I always give this example, like if you have uh, even simple linear regression, right? You can come up with a simple linear regression model if there is a uh, you know, linear relation. If the data is all over, no matter how many times you uh, iterate, you will never get a model, right? Same holds true here as well, okay? There is a limit, yeah. yeah. So if I have a code in TensorFlow 1.2, mm. and if I need to migrate it to 2.2, uh -huh. is there any direct mechanism yeah, available? Yeah, so the, the uh, easy answer for me is yes and no. <laughs> um, they do provide an upgrade tool, which I must be very honest, and probably Sundar Pichai will kill me for this. It doesn't work, OK? okay. So uh, th th I'm sure over a period of time, there is an attempt to provide you with an with a upgrade tool. Uh, but it doesn't fully work, you need to do a lot. So as of today, my suggestion is if you're doing something new and you want to do it in 2.0, start from scratch. But if you have something, rewrite the code. That is my suggestion. Yeah. Uh, one more question here. So uh, if I, do, do you know about any scenario where TensorFlow 1.0 will be a better choice compared to 2.0? Um, good and, question. Actually, I don't remember top of my head. Um, the, one of the main advantages, because underlying principle, by the way, still remains the same. Okay? okay, they removed a lot of complexity. That's the only thing. And yeah. If I compare with the PyTorch TensorFlow mm -hmm. two dot o with the PyTorch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, any point of view? Yeah, it's that? it's a pretty much comparable. See, earlier with one dot o, PyTorch was actually from a development perspective much easier. PyTorch writing code in PyTorch. That's why a lot of people used to learn. Uh, using PyTorch, but with 2.0, they have both become comparable. But then, you know, PyTorch has also enhanced quite a bit of stuff. So as of today, they are neck to neck. Okay, any other questions? So uh, I think I was just showing you, let me wind up with, uh, by showing this last thing. So in 2.0, if I want to do the same thing, right, this hello world, I just have to do, I don't have to create any session. I, I just say tf.print. And I just say hello, okay? Or I can also actually just say, okay? Or I can also actually just say, uh, if, I, if I even do this, right? It will still show, it is not very pretty. So that pretty formatting is not done, but at least it still shows the content unlike in 1.x, right? So that's the, major improvement in terms of uh, ability to learn and ability to uh, program. Good. So that's pretty much from my side. If there are any, Sir, there maybe a last question. question. Yeah. Like uh, you said for video and the image analysis, like yeah. video is nothing but a series of images. And yeah, yeah. That's Frames. how you extend yeah, yeah. Uh, video yeah, processing. Yeah, yeah. But I think uh, for uh, 
having the context of complete video say for example your frame 1 could be related to frame 2 uh -huh. right so if you have to maintain the context of analysis with uh -huh. respect to the series uh -huh. uh, uh, that has to be completely done in the user uh, space right are there any no. standard library that are doing no 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 there is nothing that needs to be done so the sequence is already taken care right in a video the frames appear in that sequence right. so as the frames are coming uh -huh. uh, the processing happens Okay. So, there is nothing we need to do special. Uh, means, uh, current library is already maintained. That yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, by the way, for that we, for doing the regular, uh, you know, uh, image processing ta stuff, we still use uh, OpenCV, by the way. Right. right. So, in order to open my video and feed it, I, open CV, I use OpenCV, okay. get the stream and feed it to my network, uh, uh, you know, frame by frame. Okay. For those type of application, we still go back to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, the basic stuff, Viewing the images, resizing, we still use OpenCV. Okay. Okay. Sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So, if there are any any more questions, if not, I think my time is up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. So, I just wanted to know. I mean, uh, we know the Keras. Oh, just before uh, before people leave, I think if there are any questions after this, I will be at the Jigsaw booth. So, please come there and feel free to meet me. Yeah. Okay, so question is like uh, Keras is a wrapper on top of TensorFlow, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, how do you compare? I mean, it is better to use Keras or uh, is it better to write directly? So there are there are two parts to it. If uh, you are in a you know production situation, you are in a job, and you really don't care about understanding everything, but you want to quickly get some code up and running, Keras is definitely better, right? But then in the long run, uh, you need to understand what's going on, right? So, you, if you have time, if you're just learning um, and without any work pressure, my suggestion is start with underlying, start with TensorFlow and then move to Keras like the slide I have shown you, right? If you follow that, you will become a kind of a master in this. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.